Hello and welcome to this, the third video in my series on absurdity in science. Here I will be looking at the ways in which we humans believe in an objective reality. In my first two videos I used the ideas of Nietzsche and Luhmann to describe human intelligence. Both men portrayed our knowledge of the world, our reason, our rationality as a cognitive application that interprets so-called reality according to a, a coarse linear systematization. This systematization prejudices us in the belief that our sensations show us the truth about things, about reality. And from this delusion there is no escape. Rational thought is interpretation according to a scheme we cannot throw off. This is what we do, how we think, how we cope. It is essentially us. It is the way we organize sense data and biochemical input. We have inherited this approach from our distant ancestors, even as far back as the amoeba in the primeval slime. Those amoeba will have developed reactive interpretations of their environment and this enabled them to survive and prosper. It is the same with humanity. At each stage in the feedback of our development, and this includes the present, a logic was formed that was sufficient for the effective interpretation of sense data. Nietzsche says not to know but to schematize to impose upon chaos as much regularity and form as our practical needs require. He goes even further to say that a residue of these past logics still remain in us, just as certain human organs recall the stage of evolution of the fish. So there must be also uh, in our brain grooves and convolutions that correspond to that cast of mind. But these grooves and convolutions are no longer the riverbed along which the stream of our sensibility runs. Did those long lost amoeba know the truth about things? <laughs> Who knows? Back in the slime our primitive forebears were thrashing around in what to them must have been a, a fantastical miasma. However, they were sufficiently adept at filtering the input from their senses that they could react in an opportunistic manner. As for humanity, many of us believe that a light bulb was switched on and the world became material and real for us, accessible to our senses, exactly as it is. The mists of all previous interpretations have been swept aside so that today our senses deliver the truth and we have been given the keys to the kingdom of knowledge. Through evolution, human intelligence has been perfected into a, a state of grace. I don't think so. We are still faced with a miasma, only we don't realize it. What if the filter of our brains leaves only what is sufficient for our needs? Granted, we are using more complex cognitive structures and senses than were available to the amoeba. However, our cognition is still restricted to what is observed through our presently evolved senses and structures. Everything else is left unobserved. We construct intellectual models that describe our world, but we explain nothing. It should come as no surprise to us that since the world is being described via structures, then it should seem regular, definite and real as I'm sure it does for the amoeba. But I'm with Nietzsche. It's far more likely that we are still trapped, forced to build on a framework set down even before the dawn of intelligence. Thus, we have developed upon the amoeba's eye view of the world, although we have cultivated far more sophisticated schemas. The progress to our present understanding of the world is entangled in an evolutionary spiral, genetically restricted, and which, according to Nietzsche, is limited by
by the curriculum of an earlier mankind. Nietzsche asks, what if our means of thought was never its original function? What if intelligence is a mere side effect of our survival? What if logic was intended as facilitation, as a means of expression and not as, not as truth? Only later did it acquire the effect of truth. What if our intellect is a consequence of the conditions of existence? A, a culmination of feedback in our species' successful quest for survival. From this perspective, human intelligence is tied to life. It is biological, genealogical, rather than logical. That human intelligence cannot be separated from what it means to be human. And the same can be said of every species. Surprisingly, Nietzsche's ideas predate by over a century those of Luhmann, the ones I used in my second video. Nietzsche says, error is a condition of observation in general. We possess a convincing criterion of reality in order to misunderstand reality in a shrewd and advantageous manner. Here he is pointing at the concept of comparison, which pervades all our thinking, which is the basis of our linear thinking of observation, thereby making the world seem real. The, the presupposition that there are identical things, that the same thing is identical at different points of time. Nietzsche is saying that the idea of sameness, the, the seed of equality and enumeration, and thus of logic, was merely appropriate during the evolution of our intelligence. It may even possibly be a cornerstone of that intelligence. Perhaps we should admit to being in the trap laid down in our evolution. Now, in my first two videos, I proposed that we accept sameness, and hence number, as a practical choice, albeit with circumscribed appropriateness, while at the same time denying any absolute validity. Such a stance is only a problem for those who insist on the logic of false opposites, grounded in sameness. Namely, those people who fail to see that logic contrives to make simple, to make consistent, that which is not. It is only the dominance of the authority of logic in our education, or should that be our conditioning, that makes it unassailable, not logic itself. Formal mathematical logic is illogical, but that doesn't mean it can't be useful. After all, its domination over our thinking is based on the authority of past usefulness. So what makes logic so appealing? With logic we describe things, we describe them well. We describe them in a way that is useful. We designate using Lumen's distinctions. We create descriptions that stand the tests of time, empirical tests. But those descriptions don't need to be true to be useful. All that remains is for us to decide whether, as individuals, we find it necessary to convince ourselves of the validity of logic in order to apply it appropriately. After all, as Nietzsche claims, logic came into being because it was useful, not because it was true. Can the products of this logical intelligence actually control what is out there? <laughs> Always assuming there is an out there. Can an amoeba control its environment? Well, up to a point. It is sobering to consider that we share a common ancestry of interpretation with that single cell. Subsequently, from that simple base, human evolution has spawned logic, mathematics and technology. But that does not mean that we can control the flux of becoming within our reality any more than the amoeba could in its environment. Perhaps what is out there is far more wonderful than our drab shadow world of linear perception can ever appreciate. What if what is out there is a flux far more complex than can be perceived 
through the naive linear inventions of our presently evolved descriptions. Critics will reject what I'm saying as paradoxical because ultimately it must describe itself within a schema that itself admits to being a false logic. They say that my use of the underlying concepts of evolution and feedback is a product of a self-confessed misinterpretation. This must negate any logical validity of the conclusions I may draw. <laughs> Does it matter? For this approach implies the true and false are themselves merely artificial concepts, sometime appropriate, uh, but they're misinterpretations born in the successful feedback of human evolution. Ours is an island of reason, of rationality, of logic, created in a sea of unreason. The culmination of our technological age is the search for truth, and now in the form of a theory of everything. And the result? Futile scientists sit canute-like on the beach, ordering back the tide of unreason. They and their followers fail to see that there is no knowing these alien waters. There is no knowing about knowing, and that there is no escape. This is an island of our own construction, an island built on sand. Nietzsche contends that only very naive people are capable of believing that the nature of man could be transformed into a purely logical one. Because the world is logical because we made it logical. We made it logical in the eons of feedback that is life on earth. Nietzsche makes it clear that the self-indulgent mind games played out in support of logic are futile. How should a tool, our intellect, be able to criticize itself when it only has itself for the critique? How can we look around our own corner? How can we trust our intelligence when it tells us that the world is real, when it is the same intelligence that created the reality in the first place? Nietzsche is implying that all arguments must ultimately undermine themselves, and every other theory for that matter, including this one. All that should concern us is whether any particular theoretical approach is appropriate to our needs, and not whether or not it is true. We have no choice other than to get on with it, accepting the complexities and ambiguities in the unknown and unknowable world. That is what we humans do all the time. Ambiguity is part of life, of reality. However, such ambiguity is only a problem when we think about it from within the cage of logic. For then, ambiguity turns us rigid with indecision, and we cease to function. And on that happy note, I'll stop. I will sign off here in the hope that you will look out for future videos in this series. Thank you.